Harvest Festival has always been one of my favorite uh, services of the year. It's a, it's a very special time. I think being brought up as a little boy in a village school where Harvest Festival was one of the real highlights of the year, it stayed with me. We're going to read a passage this morning that may at first sight seem to have little to do with harvest, but I hope by the end of the morning we'll understand uh, its relevance. And it's passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. It's a passage where it comes in the middle of Paul's explanation to the Corinthians about giving. And you may begin to get some sort of ideas what the link is with harvest. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will, be, uh, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Harvest Thanksgiving is a time for reflection. It reminds us that we are utterly and entirely dependent on God. It's very easy for us to get into the thought patterns that we are looking after ourselves. We are strong, we are independent, we are well-to-do. Who needs God? Harvest reminds us that God is absolutely in everything that we have. In, uh, for most people, Religion is something separate from real life. Religion happens in strange, rather anonymous looking buildings. We really must do something about that, mustn't we? And real life happens out in the street. God, if he exists at all, lives in that strange building. And it's something that people do in private. And it really has nothing at all to do with real life. Harvest Festival, Harvest Thanksgiving reminds us that not only does God have something to do with real life, but God is the source of all life. And if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be here at all. And so Harvest Fest Thanksgiving reminds us of three things. It's a reminder that, of God's nature. It's a reminder to be grateful. And it's a reminder to be generous. It's a reminder of God's nature. God is the creator. God is our provider. And God is a keeper of promises. And Harvest reminds us of those three things. We know, of course, that God is the creator. We, we, we believe that, don't we? But somehow, it's a kind of remote thing. If you watch the nature programs on the television, which is about the only thing on television that I really like, apart from um, detective stories. If you watch the nature programs, they talk about nature is wonderful. Nature does this, nature does that. And we can fall into that way of thinking. God is the creator, but spring follows winter, and summer follows spring, and autumn follows 
summer and winter follows autumn because it's natural. And plants germinate and they grow and they ripen because it's natural. But that's not the way the Bible sees it. Colossians 1 tells us that all things were created through him, that's our Lord Jesus Christ, and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. The world doesn't run as a natural phenomenon. The world runs because minute by minute, second by second, nanosecond by nanosecond, Jesus is holding it all together. And if he stopped holding it together, it would fall apart. And again in Hebrews, that's reiterated. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus is controlling nature moment by moment, day by day. So when we are looking at natural law, we're not looking at something that has an independent existence that does things. One of the first lessons I was taught in science was that natural law just predicts what's happened. It doesn't cause things to happen. So the law of gravity does not make things fall. The law of gravity merely says if you leave go of things, they will fall. And the thing that makes things fall is God's powerful word. The thing that holds the planets together is God's powerful word. Oops. Trying to cope with two bits of technology is difficult. God is the creator in control of the everyday things. We think the rain comes because the sun evaporates the water, the wind blows it over the land, it rises towards the mountains. I'm not quite sure why it rains in Norfolk. It rises towards the mountains and the clouds cool and the rain falls. The psalmist says, sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God in the harp. He covers the skies with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain. He makes the grass grow on the hills. He prefers provides food for the cattle. It is God acting directly that brings all these natural phenomena. And because of that, God is our provider. Matthew chapter 6, the Lord Jesus is talking about how God provides for us. It's a well-known passage. Matthew 6 and verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not the life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you really believe God provides? Yeah, good. Because a lot of us act as if we didn't. We say God provides, we sing God is faithful, and then we worry. And we're very good at worrying. Harvest reminds us that God is faithful and will provide. And then, God is a keeper of promises. 
In Genesis chapter 9, verse 16, it says, Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. Rainbows, rainbows are wonderful. There is one of the members of the church who is particularly um, pleased with rainbows. She really does see it as a sign of God's blessing on her. She's going through a tough time, and the number of times that God has shown her a rainbow um, it, it's just wonderful. But the rainbow for all of us is a, a promise that God keeps his promises. And what is it that he promises through the rainbow? As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Every time you see a rainbow, remember that the seasons are following because God has promised they will. It's part of God's covenant. But that leaves a very big question. If God's in control, why do so many things go wrong? You can't have failed to hear the news about the hurricanes. Texas, Florida, the Caribbean, and there's another one on its way. Earthquakes, big earthquake in Mexico, not sure how many have died yet. Famine, these four regions, Nigeria, South Sudan, Somalia, and the Yemen are the sort of epicenter of famine at the moment. North Nigeria, South Sudan, and the Yemen, it's due to conflict. Um, People just haven't been able to farm or their crops have been destroyed. Somalia, it's due to drought. The conflict, you can see it's people's fault. The drought, well, isn't that God's fault? Senegal, last year, had a drought that's as severe as Somalia's and nobody was hungry. Why? Because the Senegalese government took steps to make sure that food was provided for everybody. Ahead of time, they had prepared for the possibility of drought. A bit like Joseph in Egypt, yeah? The lessons there in the Bible, if only you'd look at it. One in nine people in the world today is hungry, that is, they have insufficient food to live. It's not just that they're waiting for their next meal. And that amounts to 792 million people. People without what they need. Are there explanations? Well, Human rebellion is one. Mankind was put on earth to be God's steward of the earth, to look after it, to care for it. And we rebelled. And we don't follow God's way. And the world is not the way God meant it to be. And in Romans it tells us the whole of creation is waiting for the redemption of the saints when God's going to put everything back the way he meant it to be. So part of it is human rebellion. Part is human irresponsibility. Why have we got this upsurge in hurricanes? This is the worst hurricane season there has ever been. There have been four, five major storms in the space of six weeks. The scientists tell us it's due to global warming. And why have we got global warming? Because we as human beings have been irresponsible in the way we've looked after creation. It always strikes me as strange that when things go wrong, we blame God. But when things are going right, it's down to us. And then human greed. There is enough food in the world to feed everybody. It's calculated that there is enough food in the world to give everybody 2,970 calories 
a day. That's a very precise number. I'm not quite sure why they're so precise. What is the daily requirement for life? 2,000 calories a day. So there is a buffer of nearly 1,000 calories per day per person living in the world, and still one in nine is hungry because of human greed. How much food do we in this country dump? How much food, just because it has gone past a notional best before date, gets thrown out? Human greed is part of the problem. But the harvest is not only a reminder that God's creator, it's a reminder that we need to be grateful. We are prone to take things for granted. Um, we have got big supermarkets all over the place. And they are full of everything we need. And we just assume that if we need it, we'll go to the supermarket and we'll get it. And we, we don't really worry about where food's coming from. We take it all for granted. And in fact, if we go to the supermarket and our favorite brand of whatever it is is missing, we will go and complain to the manager. There may be another perfectly good brand there, but that's not good enough for us. And this is completely the wrong attitude. The psalmist says, let people give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And every time we go into the supermarket, we should be praising the Lord for what's there. No, you praise the Lord in church, not in the supermarket. But it's not true for everybody, is it? We have a food bank in this town. We have food banks in just about every town in the UK. And in the midst of all the plenty that we have in this country, there are people who haven't got enough to eat. There are people who haven't got anything to eat. And isn't it a shame and a disgrace for us as the fifth wealthiest nation on earth that people here should be going hungry? And then on the world scale, two-thirds of the world are subsistence uh, farmers. They don't have the excess. They just are living from hand to mouth. And boy, are they grateful for harvest. We just take harvest for granted. If the yield is down 5%, the farmers start bleating. They expect to have record yields every year. And so Harvest Thanksgiving is a reminder that we need to be generous. And this is where for, uh, 2 Corinthians 9 comes in. There was a famine in Judea. Judea was the mother church. It was where Christianity started. And the other churches had grown out of it. But now there's famine in Judea. The crops had failed. Judea also had pressure of pilgrims coming in. There were millions of people extra came into Judea every year. And the church was struggling um, because the church was kind of marginalized anyway. The Apostle Paul thought that something should be done about this and he started a collection among the churches in Asia Minor and in Greece. It's interesting because in fact there was quite a bit of tension between the church in Judea and the churches in Asia Minor and in Greece. The churches in Asia Minor and Greece were predominantly Gentile. The church in Judea was Jewish. And throughout the New Testament, we see this tension going on between, can you be a Christian without becoming a Jew first? And you can imagine that there was perhaps, there could have been ill feeling between these groups. But Paul says, no, we're all one in Christ Jesus. It is our responsibility to give back to the church in Jerusalem. So let's have a collection. And 
he gives in 2 Corinthians 9, he gives the reasons. First of all, we should be generous because God has blessed us. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness so that you can give. It's, it's an interesting idea. Paul says God gives seed to the sower as well as bread for food. And, and we know that that's what happens in harvest. In harvest there is enough for us to eat but there is also seed for next year. And that's God's doing. Paul says the same principle applies to everything we have. God gives us not just enough for our needs, but enough so that we can sow the seed of righteousness into other people's lives. And whenever we feel we haven't got enough, it's because we're thinking about what we want rather than what we need. Because God has never said, I will supply all your wants. But God has said, I will supply all your needs. But he does give us more than we need. He does. And he gives us it so that we can be generous. But we need to be generous because it blesses God's people. The service that you perform supplies the needs of God's people. And as we look at the world... Our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world are struggling. We have material goods. They don't. They have spiritual strengths that we don't. And we need to, sh we need to listen to them. We need to receive from them. They need to receive from us. And our generosity brings praise to God. The service that you perform is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter uh, 5, You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Let your good deeds shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. People should be looking at us as a church and saying, the God they serve is wonderful because look at how generous they are. Look at how they reach out. Look at how they help others. Look at how they give. Their God must be a wonderful God. I wonder, do they? And the apostle gives guidelines for giving. He says, each person should give what they have decided in their hearts to give not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver so giving is a personal matter it is between you and the Lord nobody else it is not for the church leadership to stand up and make you feel guilty because you haven't given enough however sometimes we need to do that It should be thoughtful. He says, each person should give what they have decided in their heart. It's not a question of reaching into your pocket and seeing what change you've got and dropping it in the collection box. It's a question of sitting down and saying, what has God given me? What do I need? What have I got left to give? And who should I give it to? Not just dropping it into whoever's box is shaken in front of you, but thinking it through. So I have to tell you that when these chuggers stop me in the street shaking their can, I say to them, sorry, I have thought through who I give to you, and I'm afraid you're not one of the ones. <laughs> but that's, you know, we, we can feel guilty that we've got to give to everybody. It, it's an interesting 
challenge. My daughter worked at Hebron School in India, and uh, India, of course, is full of beggars. Uh, there are people whose, that's their profession, is begging. And she said, well, what do you do? Because when you walk from the school down into town, you pass hundreds of people. And a very wise, older uh, missionary said to her, pray that the Lord will lead you to the one that you are supposed to support. And so that's what she did. And so she formed a relationship with one of these people, and she gave to that person, but she didn't just throw the cash in. She talked to them. She engaged with them. They became friends. So, thoughtful giving. Giving should be private. Again, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you are giving to the needy, don't do it the way some people do, where they get a trumpet and blow the trumpet and say, look what I'm doing. Do it in secret. And God who sees in secret will reward you. And giving should be cheerful. Giving is not a duty which must be endured. Giving is a pleasure which should be enjoyed. Giving should be cheerful. Paul says it shouldn't be reluctantly or under compulsion. You shouldn't have somebody coming up to you and saying, the church is struggling, cough up or we'll have to close the doors. You should be coming and saying, God has blessed me, and here is my gift to show how much I appreciate it. And then Paul ends with the greatest example of all. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. His son who came as a baby, who lived among us and taught among us, who died on the cross for us, and who rose again. He's the indescribable gift. And Paul says in Romans 8, if God didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? What are you worried about? And Harvest reminds us that our God is a giving God, a loving God, a God who cares for us. Let's give him thanks.